Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Allahümme salli ve sellem ve barik ala seyyidi Muhammed. Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. And not only welcome, but thank you. Thank you for coming here. Because we, we, your presence here is already a success. Your presence here is a, is a success because it brings us together. So anyone who wants to go home, you've already succeeded, you can go home now. <laughs> But no, for real, thank you for coming here. Is this anyone's first time to a mosque? Wow, beautiful, beautiful. So we're going to give you a round of applause for coming here. Thank you for opening your hearts and coming here. Uh, this is a, this is a, you're always welcome here. This is a community center. And honestly, you know, we're, we're all brothers and sisters in humanity. You know, your fellow Muslims, Neighbors, they, they're human too. <laughs> you know, they're human, they laugh, they cry, they get hurt. See, I just got hurt here. Yeah. I was on my daughter's bike, she's nine years old. I was going down a hill and uh, I put my, my feet on the pegs, trying to go down kind of like Superman style, not a good idea. But it, it was okay because my three daughters ran around me and they started taking care of me. And I was like, wow, it feels nice to be a father and be loved like this. But Yes, yeah, so welcome and thank you for coming here. And thank you for coming here because it, it helps us feel what is true, which is this is our home in America. Um, I think, uh, you know, I was born here... Um, and you'll hear from the panelists, I think uh, we've been here essentially all our lives. This is where we call home. So if someone says, go back home, where should I go, to Chicago, <laughs> Michigan, go back home. I thought this is my home, you know. Um, so thank you for coming here and helping us feel what is true, is that this is our American home and, and we're in this together. We're in trying times, we're in difficult times, we're in confusing times. But. That's the beauty of this world, because when we come together, then we'll triumph. And this is an example of a triumphant feat today, a triumphant activity, and it's successful because of you. It's because you decided to get up on your Saturday morning, get in your car, and drive to your local mosque. And so thank you. Thank you again. So today's panel is about meet your local Muslim neighbor. So who are your local Muslim neighbors? And we're a different, you'll see, you know, you'll see a doctor, you'll see a teacher, a principal, you see a real estate guru, myself, I'm a lawyer. Uh, my name is Mahdi, and I'm born and raised in Chicago. I've been a lawyer for about 13 years, I have three daughters, and I work for Dell Corporation. I graduated from the first accredited liberal arts Muslim college in Berkeley, California, the first ever accredited in the history of America and the Western Hemisphere. And that's in Berkeley. So there's exciting times because there's a, the, it's exciting because there's a resurgence and a revival of true, true, correct understanding of what Islam is. And so today we have the framework of our presentation is broken up into three parts. In line with the, the Islamic spiritual tradition, the first step is taqliya. Taqliya means to clean to empty out. And who's doing our tahliya today is our is our dear Hina and Mike. And their their role today is to help clear some of the misconceptions. To clear some of the misconceptions that exist. The second step is tahliya. Tahliya is to then adorn and to fill with beauty. And for that we've tasked Dr. Asad Tarsim. And Dr. Asad will tell you won't answer the question, what isn't Islam? But he will answer, what is Islam? So first we're going to answer, what isn't Islam? And then, what is Islam? And then the third, the third step of the spiritual path is tajliya. Tajliya means elevation. And we've given that onus to our dear sister Sarah to elevate all of us <laughs> in this room. So, without, so our first speaker is Hina Muhtar. Hina is a writer, speaker, teacher, mother, principal, and her most difficult job is being a wife. 
<laughs> and uh, she is our myth buster. Without further ado, please welcome Hina Mukhtar. Um, 
our rules of inheritance, our rules of marriage, our rules of divorce. All of this comes under Sharia. So it's the day-to-day -day life uh, rules for Muslims, not for anybody else. And one of the things that people may not realize is that Islam actually does not allow for anarchy or chaos. Muslims need to live under some form of government, even if it's not a Muslim government. And they need to respect the laws of the land. That's according to Sharia. So if Muslims feel that they're being persecuted or they can't practice their religion in peace and safety, then Sharia tells them that they need to migrate. They need to leave from that land. And the highest law of the land here in the United States of America is the Constitution. So for Muslims, according to Sharia, respecting and following the Constitution is part of our understanding of how we practice our faith. Um, and with everything that's happening right now in the political landscape, trust me, that nobody wants to protect the Constitution more than Muslim Americans right now. So when people hear about Sharia, what they're actually wondering about are the penal code punishments. So what are the penal code punishments? Do they actually exist? People have images of stonings and beheadings and whippings and cutting off of hands. So there is a penal code punishment for certain um, transgressions under Sharia law, but that makes up 0.1% of the entire body of the Sharia law. And just like in the United States of America, there are certain capital punishments for certain um, crimes, the same thing exists in Sharia as well. But the important differences between capital punishment in American law and capital punishment in Sharia law are two. The first is that the penal code is first and foremost meant to be a, as a deterrent. It's not actually meant to be implemented. And the second is that the evidence required to prove a capital crime is very, very difficult. So for example, the punishment for adultery under Sharia is, um, is death. However, to prove that somebody has committed adultery, you actually need four eyewitnesses who actually can say, I saw the act happening. So it's really meant to illustrate how grave the sin or the crime is for Muslims. And so it's making it clear to us as a society that this is how big of a transgression this is and you need to avoid it. And if we're going to look at how Sharia is actually implemented, we need to actually look at the Ottoman Empire, which was the last legitimate Muslim government that ruled a large portion of the world for almost 700 years. The punishment for adultery during that time, almost 700 years, was implemented only once. And even then, it was considered to be politically motivated, and the scholars spoke out against it, and it was never repeated again. 700 years. The other very important fact for people to understand is that according to Sharia itself, the laws of Sharia can only be applied and upheld when there is a legitimate Muslim government in power. And a majority of the Muslim scholars today say that no such government actually exists anymore. There's no official body which has the authority to implement penal code punishments. But unfortunately, when people hear the words Sharia law, that's all they think of, are grisly capital punishments. What you see on the internet, what you see in certain news stories, Muslims consider that to actually be vigilante justice. There's no um, legality behind it, there's no authority behind it. And it's no way sanctioned in Islam, in the religion of Islam. Now, before moving on to the next myth, I'd like to share with you uh, some of the principles, the foundations of Sharia. As Muslims, we believe that all Sharia laws are divinely inspired, and therefore, as Muslims, we think that they're the perfect set of laws for mankind. Now, upon close study of Sharia, one will find that each and every part of Sharia is meant to protect one out of six things, 
So any rule or law that you see in Sharia will protect one of six things. The first is the right to religion, meaning that nobody can force you to convert or nobody can force you to not practice your faith. The second is the right to life. That means that nobody can be killed unjustly. The third is the right to family and lineage. So everyone has a right to know where they come from. That's why sex is sanctioned only within the rules of marriage. The fourth is the right to honor. You can't slander, lie, or backbite against people. Something like tabloid journalism would be something not allowed under Sharia. The fifth is the right to intellect and reason. So you don't take intoxicants, you don't take recreational drugs, anything that affects your ability to think. However, Sharia is very nuanced. It's not black and white. So when it comes to things like anesthesia during surgery, there would be exceptions to that rule. And then the sixth is the right to property. So you can't steal, usurp people's wealth, or cheat anyone out of what's theirs. I think, as far as my notes are concerned, I covered what I have about Sharia, so I'm going to move on to the... Oh, one last thing I wanted to explain is that Muslims worship God with their bodies, their minds, and their souls, which are also their hearts. And anything that has to do with Sharia has to do with our bodies. And Dr. Asad will later be explaining a little bit about what we do with our minds and with our hearts. But Sharia has to do with anything physical. Okay, the second myth is that women are oppressed in Islam. That's probably, I, I was in a Trader Joe's and I had a woman stop and, and strike up a conversation with me and you know, she was asking me about some of the things in my cart and then after a couple, like maybe a minute she said to me, um, by the way, you do know to call 911 if he ever lays a hand on you, right? What do you even say to that? I, I was so startled, I actually laughed because I didn't think she was serious. And then she went on to say, you have rights in this country. So, so that's a big myth that's out there. So are some Muslim women oppressed? Yes. Do some Muslim majority countries have a culture which is oppressive to women? Yes. Are there stories of domestic violence in some Muslim household? Absolutely, yes. But does Islam teach, condone, or in any way support the oppression of women? Absolutely not. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said the best of you are the ones who are the best to their women. The majority of the focus of his last sermon before he passed away was on the rights of women. And Muslims believe in the story of Adam and Eve, just like the Jews and the Christians do except Muslims don't hold Eve, hold Eve accountable for Adam's mistakes. They were both held equally responsible. She's not the one to blame. She's not considered to be a temptress. She's not the reason mankind lost paradise. So there are a few reasons that Islam gets a bad rap when it comes to women. The first would probably be the first thing people see, which is the hijab, which often gets translated as the headscarf but hijab actually means barrier. It sets up boundaries for how we interact with one another. It's the first thing people see, and they don't understand it. And they're usually not thinking of the Virgin Mary when they see <laughs> the hijab on Muslim women's heads. What they're usually wondering is, why do women have to wear it and men don't? Men do, Muslim men do have parts of their bodies that they have to cover according to our, our Sharia. For men, it is they have to cover everything from the navel to the knee. So they can't wear speedos, they can't wear shorty shorts, uh, they can't show their kneecaps or their belly buttons. Um, for women, it's everything but the hands, the face, and the feet. Now why different rules? We believe, like we said, that Sharia is divinely inspired. But if you even look at our laws here in the United States of America, there's different rules. If a man wants to go jogging in your neighborhood park and it's a hot day, he can take off his shirt and continue jogging and nobody will bat an eye. If a woman was to take off her shirt and continue jogging, she'd be arrested for public indecency. So why are the rules different? So for us, it's, we believe that our creator who created us knows what's best for us and so we submit to those rules. Okay, the second thing people see is that the women pray behind the men in, in the congregational prayer. 
And they often think in the Rosa Parks kind of framework that, oh, if you're in the back, then it's like you're at the back of the bus and you're a secondary citizen. But it's actually, that's not the way we look at the prayer. Where you stand in the prayer and who's leading the prayer has nothing to do with your standing in front of God. Everybody is equal in the sights, in the eyes of God. Um, we stand shoulder to shoulder in prayer. It's very intimate. We stand, we bow, we prostrate on the ground with our bottoms up in the air. And it's, um, many Muslim women would not feel comfortable having men standing behind them watching them pray in that position. So it's really about privacy and modesty. It's not about where we stand with God. And the last one is that um, people often confuse how women are treated in countries like Saudi Arabia with how Islam treats women in general. Now the law, we recently read the headlines that it's been changed, but as the fact that up until 2017, women in Saudi Arabia could not drive, people often ask me about that. You're part of a religion that doesn't let you drive. No, I'm not. The fact that women in Saudi Arabia could not drive was because of a Saudi law, not because of an Islamic law. Muslim women have been heads of state They've been leaders of countries. The vice president of Iran right now is a woman. Here in America, we have yet to shatter that glass ceiling. And uh, so the Saudi government can make whatever laws they want to, but that doesn't give them legitimacy over the world's population of Muslims. So those are the two myths I was going to cover. I'm going to hand it over to Mike now, and uh, we'll tackle some more topics during Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Everyone, we've passed out some note cards for a, one of the essential segments of this gathering is the Q&A. So anything on your mind, be real, be open, be honest, write the question down. Uh, we have a no knowledge rule here. So if we say anything that doesn't make sense, if we say a word that doesn't make sense, please, please go ahead and write that question down. And make this a meaningful day. Make this a meaningful moment. Make this a meaningful gathering. So when we leave today, that we all leave, in a, we benefited something, you took something home. But the onus is on you to make it meaningful. We'll do our part and answer any questions. So I have a question. Does anyone know how many Muslims serve in the U.S. Armed Forces? <coughs> any guesses? Probably about 2%. 2%. What's the total number of armed forces? 4,000. 4,000 Muslims serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. We have a Marine sitting right here, he used to serve in the Marines. And our next speaker, Mike, served the Naval Academy as well. Does anyone know, according to the FBI, what percent of the terrorism is caused by Muslims? About four to six percent. Four to six percent. Does anyone know, I'm sorry to ask this question, in the last 72 hours, how many acts of gun violence occurred in America. 240, 240 acts of gun violence in the last 72 hours in our home, in our home. 60, about 60 people were murdered and about 179 were injured. Now the interesting thing, I raised that because it's relevant to Mike's presentation that he's going to talk about terrorism, jihad, ISIS, is because none of those acts, none of those 240 acts, were mentioned prominently on the news because there was no Islam, Islamic, Muslim element to it. That, But if it, one of them, God forbid, or any of them, God forbid all of them, was Muslim, then we'd hear about it, and then it would affect our psyche. May God pr protect this country. So our next speaker, Mike Kim, He's, uh, he works in real estate, father of seven. I don't know how he has time to do anything else. And uh, without further ado, please welcome Mike Kim. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so uh, my task is to continue the myth busting and talk about uh, jihad and uh, ISIS. But before I do that, maybe I'll share with you a quick story of, of how I came to Islam because I wasn't born Muslim, I converted to Islam. Um, I grew up here in the Bay Area, and and uh, through my uh, college years at the at the U.S. Naval Academy, I was filled with all sorts of misconceptions about Islam. And in the eyes of military personnel, in particular, 
you know, Muslims were considered the enemy, right? The not us, the them. So Islam was to me at face value 22 years ago, a very foreign concept and something that was very distant. Um, it wasn't until my freshman year at Annapolis where we were given an assignment. Pretty innocuous, the assignment was to uh, research and write the biographies of the most uh, eminent scientists, philosophers uh, of the Western civilization. So I found myself in the library, flipping through the books, um, and I came across this passage and it really struck me, which was that all these great philosophers and mathematicians and scientists like René Descartes, Isaac Newton, so on and so forth, were believers in a transcendental or a deity or a universal. These are academic neutral terms for God. So what was incredible to me was that I was never taught that anywhere. That the greatest minds in the Western civilizations, at the core of it, were trying to understand the created universe through their life's work. It was an incredible uh, awakening moment for me. So from that moment, it launched me on a quest. And the quest was to really understand, because I mean, obviously, these are brilliant minds. And if they were believers in a created universe, there's something to that. So it launched me on a quest to figure out what is this whole thing about, this God and the created universe. So uh, throughout the remainder of my years at the Naval Academy, I studied, debated, read books, questioned. Um, in fact, one of my uh, favorite pastimes was you guys know St. John's University in Annapolis, a well known liberal arts where they study the great books. I used to drop my homework and go over there in their coffee shop and debate them about. Know, such matters, and uh, I learned more than, than I contributed, certainly, from them. So, through that course of, through, through that process, I established what I was a fairly strict criteria of the type of religion that I was going to subscribe to, from a philosophical standpoint, sociological standpoint, scientific standpoint. For example, from a scientific standpoint, it was important to me that, um, that the uh, that the revelation was ahead of scientific discovery. That scientific discovery should support and validate revelation. Because after all, we're talking about the creator of the universe. How can he be wrong? He most certainly cannot, right? So, so and I found Islam it certainly did meet that standard and exceed it. And we don't have time to get into it, but you can certainly look up the scientific proofs of, of, of Islam, and there's a whole, you know, you can Google, there's all kinds of documents and books written by, by people, you know, highly qualified. Uh, uh. So, part of the process, though, I was having to do with warfare. So for me as a naval officer, it concerned me greatly how we conduct ourselves in warfare. Because we knew, whether you're at West Point, Air Force Academy, or, or Naval Academy, we are taught that there's a moral code to how you conduct yourself in warfare. Because if we don't, we may walk away from the battlefield damaged. So we have to apply a moral code. The circumstances in which we take a life matters as a human being. Because we go against our very nature in conducting warfare because it is a brutal act, right? So, in, so living by a certain moral code was of the utmost importance. And um, interestingly enough, uh, Islam says quite a bit about such matters. Uh, to give you an example, in the Quran it says that I'm going to read here. Permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made, because they have been wrong. Those who have been driven out from their homes unjustly, only because they say, our Lord is God. In another passage, it states, And if God did not repel some men by means of others, there would surely have been pulled down temples and churches and synagogues and mosques. You'll know two things. Fighting is sanctioned for defensive purposes only. Secondly, it doesn't say just mosques, right? It's the universality of religion. In the Quran, it explicitly states all religions must be protected. So for example, if the, the, the Christians in a certain community were being attacked, it is a, 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 a Quranic injunction upon us to protect that Christian community. It says it's on the Quran, unambiguous. Okay, so as I, as I researched more and more, I, I found that the standards of, of the just war concept in Islam was quite comprehensive and voluminous, and we won't have time to get into it, but our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, implemented that moral code, uh, because in addition to being a parent, a husband, 
son, brother, businessman, student, and teacher, he was also a warrior because we believe that he was the last prophet for end of time. Therefore, uh, that prophet had to bring the, the comprehensive aspect of humanity, right? And, and be able to give us examples and guidance in, in, in that full spectrum of our human existence, which includes warfare, because you know that is the, the that is the world in which we live. So he, I want to share with you just quick um, ten bullet points that he implemented to his soldiers when it came to uh, 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 applying the moral code. And they're on that handout, so I'll be through it pretty quickly. You can uh, read it at, at your leisure. It says, do not harm women, children, elderly, or the sick. Do not commit treachery and never mutilate or disfigure. Do not uproot, cut down, or burn trees. Do not harm any livestock except for food. In combat, avoid striking the face, for God created all of us in the image of Adam, the prophet Adam. He's doing. Do not kill the monks in monasteries and do not kill those sitting in places of worship. Do not destroy the villages and towns. Do not spoil the cultivated fields and gardens, meaning you can't starve people in warfare. Do not wish for an encounter with the enemy. Pray to God to grant you security, but when you are forced to encounter them, exercise patience. No one may punish with fire except the Creator. So, weapons of mass destruction, chemical, nuclear, napalm, atomic, all of that we forbid in, in Islam because it's, it's, it's fire. And finally, accustom yourself to do good, people do good, and do not do wrong, even if they commit wrong. So incidentally on number seven, do not destroy villages, do not spoil cultivated uh, fields and gardens. I was listening to NPR the other day, and they were talking about PTSD, the kind in which your, your moral code, your morality was violated because the act that you participated in or witnessed. And the soldier was asked, um, what would you like to do given your experience in Iraq? He said, I would like to go back to Iraq and help rebuild the farms that we destroyed. <coughs> you see, here's your average American person with that sense of morality saying, what I witnessed there was, was we, the American military, went and destroyed people's backyard and little cult farms and fields. He felt that was an injustice. And it says right here, do not destroy the villages or towns. Do not spoil the... So these moralities are universal. It's not just ours. It's, it's a universal morality, right, that applies to all of this humanity. So, so these things resonated with me um, because it wasn't, it, it no longer became foreign because it, it resonates with your heart, right? It's like, yeah, I believe that. So anyways, let me get to jihad in the, in the interest of time and um, ISIS. So jihad, um, the term jihad in Arabic does not in and of itself have anything to do with war. The root war, the root word for jihad is jih, which means to make an effort or exert oneself. So the precise definition is to make an effort or exert oneself in the way of God. In other words, do good, be a good person. So, so whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, you guys all are, are embarked in jihad, which is to be a good person. That is the, the, the greater jihad, okay? There's a lesser jihad, which, is, which has a component of, of warfare and defense, as I just uh, mentioned. So an example of greater jihad, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, stated that the best jihad is to speak truth to a tyrannical leader. So the way we say in America is speak truth to power, right? Be honest and be truthful. That is the highest form of jihad. Another example that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked by a young, young man permission to join the military, the Prophet's response was, perform jihad by serving your parents. So that gives you a little taste of the greater jihad the moral struggle against your own ego, and to speak, uh, to be a good, upright citizen. Okay, uh, the lesser jihad does include uh, warfare. Now incidentally, all Muslims, all Muslims are required to, to, to engage in the greater jihad, the struggle against your own ego. But not all Muslims are required to engage in the lesser jihad, the military conflict, because there's certain criteria. You have to be a, a man of a certain age and, you know, not, uh, be the caretaker of elderly, so just all sorts of criteria as to whether you qualify to be in, in, the, in the military. So that's an important uh, point. Um, so defense and fighting, as I mentioned. So some of the controversies is religious, religious conversion, territorial conquest, 
and acquisition of political power are not sanctioned reasons for, for jihad for combat. Uh, okay, so finally ISIS. So what, is, what about ISIS? Uh, there's a misperception that ISIS somehow is a, is a is part and parcel of this Sunni Islam. It, it's not, okay? But we consider them vigilantes, essentially. And, and, and as a result of the geopolitical condition in which there was a power vacuum created. It's the functional equivalent of if Russia came to our country, destroyed our governmental, police, and security apparatus, and left. Who's going to fill that power vacuum? The Mississippi militia, probably. And somebody somewhere in the world would call them crazy terrorists, right? So that is a geopolitical reality. ISIS, it, you know, the, the fact that they claim whatever they claim, that doesn't give them any sort of uh, credence in, in, in broader, the Big Ten Islam. Uh, you know, young boy, he said it best recently when he asked his mom, how can ISIS say that they're Muslim? They do everything the opposite of what we are taught to do. They take everything that is beautiful and make it ugly. So there you go. Young boy, you got to figure it out. So one way to look at ISIS is to, is to say, ISIS is to Islam what the KKK is to Christianity. I think it's a real sort of poignant way to look at it. Um, so, okay, I think I'm done. Time's up, they say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
famous and prominent um, Muslims. Uh, anybody recognize? I mean, one of them has his name right on his head. So. <laughs> Forget that. Anybody recognizing somebody? What's that? I recognize the other two. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so one of the left is Cat Stevens and it's Muhammad Ali. Cat Stevens and, and, and Muhammad Ali. One is a British, um, I guess he's Greek in, in uh, 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 this Greek in origin. Um, and uh, Okay, is, it, is that something in there? Uh, and then uh, Muhammad Ali, obviously being African American, um, formerly known as Cassius Clay. So we're going to just go through these again. Um, so it is not, so, you know, Muslims are not people from one part of the world, not necessarily quote unquote foreign, although I, I would argue that there is a lot of people who make a lot of effort to make it seem that way. Um, it's, uh, it's a, it's a religion as universal as any other, the same way Christian doesn't mean from any part of the world. Or a Buddhist doesn't necessarily mean that they're from a part of the world. Um, it's the same for Muslim. There are Indonesian Muslims, there are African Muslims, there are over 60 million Muslims in China, um, there are some in Burma, Myanmar, if you've been following the news there. Uh, Muslims are from all over. Um, so, continuing with the definitions, um, I want to talk about who is Allah. And again, this is uh, in the interest of removing some of that mystery that can sometimes surround uh, uh, Islam. So if you look there, that is, uh, it's probably too small for some of you to see, but that is a copy of the New Testament in Arabic. And the first line says, What's the first line? Sorry, this is the Old Testament. This is, uh, this is Genesis. What's, what's the first line of Genesis? In the beginning, God created the heavens, right? But it says Allah. So Allah is simply the Arabic name for God, used by Arabic-speaking Jews, Christians, Maimonides, if anybody has heard of him would often write in Arabic, and you would talk about God uh, as, as Allah. Uh, and so this is, this is simply what we would in English call God with a capital G. So it's not the God of the Muslims, but this is God with a capital G, the one who created the heavens and the earth, uh, the God who sent Abraham, uh, uh, Noah, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, all of them um, are, would be, uh, would in their original tongues, uh, be called Allah. So how does Islam see itself if we believe all of these prophets were talking about Allah or were sent by Allah, right? God. So what does that mean? So Islam sees itself um, as a culmination of the previous religions. So Islam does not see itself as a new religion alongside of or independent of these other religions that sort of came and were false and, you know, these people, Moses and whoever, I don't know what they were talking about but the Prophet Muhammad is, is a prophet. Uh, quite, quite the opposite of that, Islam sees itself as a continuation, a completion, and a culmination. Um, some authors like to use the uh, distinction between Islam with a capital I and Islam with a lowercase i. And what that means is, Islam means what again? What does the word Islam mean in Arabic? Surrender. To surrender, to surrender oneself over to. And so what they will say is, all of God's prophets and all previous peoples we're in a state of surrender to God. So would we in Arabic say the people on the ark with, with Noah, they were in a state of surrender. So we would say that they were in a state of Islam in the lowercase i sense, that it is, it's a way of being. So it's not a religion named after a people or a tribe or named after the founder of the religion, right? Or it's, it's, it's a religion that takes its name from the central feature of all of God's ancient religions, which is to surrender oneself over to. Um, there's a famous tradition from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he tells, you know, prophets always speak in parables, right? So he uses the parable, he says, um, uh, the likeness of my coming is like a beautiful edifice or building in which people are walking around and they're saying, oh my, what a beautiful structure this is. And they say, oh, except it's just missing that one brick there. And he says, I am that final brick. And so the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not see himself it's a beautiful metaphor. He could have said, there's this old, decrepit building, and somebody destroys it and builds another nicer building, right? If most religions like to see themselves as sort of the best thing, right? And they will create an understanding within the religion that says all other religions just have it completely wrong and we're the only ones who know it right. Islam is, is something uh, uh, different than that, and it says that it's a completion of these, of these previous religions. Um, there's a tradition from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he said that God has sent over 124,000 prophets to humanity. We know of 25 by name, so when we talk about 
Ishmael, Jacob, and Moses, and Abraham, right? Enoch, all of these people. Uh, those are the 25 that we know by name in, in, in the Muslim tradition. But we also know that God sent guidance to all mankind. So you have the Aborigines in Australia, the Native Americans here in North America. Muslims would believe that they had guidance sent to them. We can't confirm what it is, what happened to it, what does it look like. Um, but we know that when we encounter an ancient tradition, sometimes we find truth therein. And that truth is because they have remnants uh, of, of, of revelation. Uh, so it allows a respectful dialogue with all religions because they they, uh, their, their origin could be, have been something that is, uh, that is divine. Uh, now what I'd like to focus on, this is the, the easiest way to summarize the religion of Islam. There are three dimensions to the religion of Islam. This is what the quiz will be on, right? <laughs> three dimensions. So it's faith, conduct, and character. You have to have each of these three for a complete expression of Islam, right? So the first, what I want to focus on is conduct. And this is part of what Hina was talking about when she said worshiping with the body. When we talk about the body, really what we mean are actions, right? We mean actions. So these are things, uh, who here has heard of the five pillars of Islam? Yeah, okay, a few hands. The five pillars of Islam are just one dimension. It's the, the conduct. These are the five things that every Muslim must com commit to do. The first is to proclaim the two testimonies. This is a short phrase by which uh, a person declares their faith. This is the way in which a person enters into the, fo the fold of Islam. Uh, it is simply by declaring that I testify that nothing is worthy of worship save God and that Muhammad is the final messenger of God. Um, and when, when a person declares that and believes it, they have to accept and affirm all of the previous prophets before that. A person cannot affirm the prophethood of, of, of Muhammad by denying Jesus, or Moses, or Abraham, or Noah, because the Prophet Muhammad affirmed that. The second are five daily prayers. So based on the position of the sun, right, whether it's dawn, or noon, or the afternoon, sunset, or the nighttime, Muslims take time to wash and perform a ritual prayer. Every Muslim who's above the poverty line must give a 2.5% uh, of their savings, of their unused wealth, as charity. That's called the purifying charity. So this isn't on your full income. It's not an income tax, per se, right? But if you uh, have a certain amount of money, and after you take care of your needs, etc., you have an amount that's left over, um, that 1 40th of that must be given in charity uh, as a minimum. And then fasting the month of Ramadan. There is a holy month in the Muslim calendar. It's the ninth month of the lunar calendar, in which Muslims uh, fast from the break of dawn all the way until sunset. Um, and they abstain from food, drink, intimacy, um, and they engage in, a, uh, in an intense self-disciplinary uh, month of exercise um, where they increase their devotions, uh, and it's all about controlling oneself. And the last uh, pillar of actions to be performed is the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca, uh, which was founded by Abraham and Ishmael. That there's an actual sacred house was built by Abraham and Ishmael, uh, and Ishmael was actually buried there. Um, and so that is conduct. So we've said faith, conduct, and character. So now I'd like to cover faith um, briefly. Um, and faith are realities that we must believe in. So as uh, you know, was mentioning, that we believe that we must surrender to God in our bodies, and this is the minds. So. Well, our beliefs are to affirm realities and truths as they exist in the world, right? So if I believe the earth is flat, right? And I realize that there's like this resurgence of the flat earth movement, so I'm not taking it to Jackson. Right? But I, I, either it is or it isn't, right? And if I, am, if I feel that the earth is flat, if I believe the earth is flat, is that an action or is that an incorrect conception that I have? It's an incorrect conception. So that's, that is what faith addresses is conceptions of the world. So the first is a belief in God. Now, one of the interesting things about Islam is Muslims do not believe that faith is juxtaposed with reason. Okay, so faith is not to withhold your reason as a sign of your faith. What Muslims believe, a very interesting relationship between faith and reason, is that faith is based upon reason. And it's supported by reason. And we could get into this maybe a little bit more 
in the Q&A, but Muslims believe that you have to have a rational, you should have a rational proof for believing in God. Uh, uh, and one that, that, is, that is not contradicted by reason. Uh, the second is to believe in angels. So we believe in God, and then God has told us that he has created beings uh, in another dimension um, uh, that are called angels, and they interact with our world in various ways. We believe that God sends communication called revelation. Uh, which is super rational, doesn't contradict reason, as, as uh, Brother Mike was, was reminding us, uh, that revelation should never contradict reason uh, or science or any of the things that we can know with certainty, uh, but in, instead affirms it. So this scripture is super rational. Uh, all Muslims believe in the Torah as it revealed from God, the Psalms, uh, the Gospel, and the Quran. What Muslims will believe is that as time carried on, the authenticity of these documents was compromised, like any other sort of historical document. Um, and one of the great miracles of the Prophet Muhammad is that God promised him that he will vouchsafe the Quran. And that is something uh, academics can agree on, even if they don't believe in the divine source of the Quran, they will affirm that it's the same document that they had in the, in, in the seventh century Arabia. Uh, we believe in messengers, that these are people that God sends um, as, as intermediaries to communicate his will to us. Um, when it comes to all of the other prophets, it's a pretty straightforward belief. Uh, Jesus is a bit of a unique figure. I think it's very obvious, very interesting that he returns at the end of time uh, in, in both Muslim uh, and, and uh, Christian uh, eschatology because there's, there's so much um, dispute about his nature. Uh, the Muslim conception of Jesus is probably closer to an early Unitarian view that Jesus was born of a virgin birth, that he was indeed the awaited Messiah, that he will return at the end times, etc. but yet he was a mortal prophet. That when we say he was the son of God, that that is a metaphor, a metaphorical and not a literal meaning, meaning he was a man of God, a godly man, etc. Um, so we affirm Jesus as a messenger, um, but Muslims do not believe that the divine can be incarnated in, into creation. Uh, and then we believe in a day of judgment in which all of us will be resurrected uh, before our Creator uh, and uh, held accountable for our deeds. Um, and the last is we believe in what's called divine decree, uh, which means that destiny is something that cannot escape us, and that God has decreed everything to be, and that nothing happens outside of His will. So the last, we said faith, conduct, and character, right? Before I get into character, I, I think it's helpful to talk a little bit about how Islam views the human being, what is human, humankind. So first we believe that we have a human nature, and it, there's a primary nature to our humanity. The, the primary nature is an innate knowledge of right and wrong. It is that aspect of us that if we're healthy, um, that can see beauty in a sunset, that feels guilt when we do something wrong, um, that knows that some things are beautiful and good and true, and other things are, um, are, 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 to, are, are worthy of guilt and not doing and condemning. We have an innate sense of morality, that this is not something that we simply learn through culture, but that we actually have it imprinted on our souls. And you can see this with children, um, especially when they tell you, that's not fair. Like, why is that a refrain of children, right? You know, no, no cookie, that's not fair. They have this innate sense of justice, of right and wrong, um, etc. Uh, but on the other hand, we also have a very selfish ego nature. Um, and what this means is that each of us has a capacity, perhaps even a tendency, to have a, uh, a vengeful and carnal appetite. And what that means is sometimes we can lash out at those who we feel uh, are threatening us and harming us. Uh, modern day uh, psychologists would call this the R brain, right? And then we also have a nature that is concerned with fulfilling the appetites. Um, and this is something, again, in the Catholic tradition that you'll see um, as, as well. And so these two parts, our primary nature that knows and is attracted to all that is good and beautiful, and our selfish ego are, in, are uh, essential to understand and knowing about the development of character. For Muslims, we purify our soul by purging our egos of these vices, of the desire for jealousy and hatred and envy and all of these things that... that are there within us as, as, as latent uh, potentialities. Um, and we have to adorn ourselves, it takes a little bit of hard work, with being generous and forgiving 
and loving, right, and altruistic, uh, etc. So these two things, it is by suppressing the selfish ego and enhancing and developing our primary nature. Um, at the same time, we believe in a certain type of Muslim asceticism. Um, and what this is, is this means that we have uh, a balance between rejecting the world uh, outright, living a monastic life, right, and indulging in it. That this world, uh, there's a famous uh, uh, statement in the Muslim tradition on, uh, on the tongue of Jesus, peace be upon him, in which he says that this world is a bridge, right? And so you have to not invest in the bridge, but see it for its destination, which is the afterlife. And so that is that is the balance that we have to... Uh, one Muslim sage put it best when he said, um, true asceticism is to have the world in your hand, but not in your heart. Okay, so that's, that, that is what Muslims uh, see. So these three dimensions of the religion, uh, again, just to reiterate, uh, are a result of a tradition that sees itself as bringing together all of the teachings of the previous religious traditions. Um, they will bring peace and harmony, based on the word Islam, to self and society if fully embodied. Uh, embodied pardon me. Um, and Muslims will use the term quite often of the middle road. This is a, a phrase um, in, the, in the Holy Quran in which God says that we have, we have made you a middle nation. Um, and some of the commentators have talked about that this is the merging of the rich legal tradition found in the Torah and the higher spiritual callings found in the Gospel. And that you, you, with the merging of these, uh, you have both the, the Sharia on the one hand, right? You have the actions and the moral code of, of how we are to behave, uh, but that we also have, we have both the, the law, the letter of the law, and the spirit of the law. Uh, and that you don't have to uh, abolish the letter of the law to preserve the spirit of the law, right? And that both can, can, can be um, preserved, and that is what, what uh, Islam brings together. So just to recap, there are uh, uh, the three dimensions, which are faith, conduct. Faith is truth in the mind. Conduct is goodness and acts of the body. And the last is character, which is beauty of the soul. So there are th these, these correspond to the three central virtues of Islam. Goodness, truth, and beauty. And that's what each of us seeks. Goodness in our, in our, in our, in our behavior, truth in what we know and perceive to, be, to, to believe, and beauty of, of our characters. Um, so this is the best that I could do to, to uh, summarize what Islam is as a, as a complete tradition. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, hopefully we'll have some conversations. Enjoy this in more detail uh, in his in the in the book Being Muslim: A Practical Guide. Again, he didn't tell me to say this, by the way, or to plug the book, but uh, I'm, I'm, a I'm a fan. I order it by the hundreds. I get a good deal. So finally, so we did tahliya, we did tahliya, and now for tajliya. So we cleaned up some of the some of the space or false ideas. We adorned it with some of these ideas and beautified it. And finally, for some elevation, our final panelist, one of my personal role models, Sarah Kim, uh, a mother, a wife, operates the Siena Ranch in Lafayette, a fully functional ranch, many bustling activities for our children. And Sarah Kim is going to, to share with us a little bit about her story and bringing together how Islam made her a better American. And so, please, let's enjoy Sarah's story as she shares, and please welcome her with love. So, uh, we formed this panel uh, almost exactly one year ago, uh, maybe a little bit more now, actually, a year and three months or so, in response to some of the horrific things that were being said about Muslims in the media. After a few days of feeling somewhat helpless after the San Bernardino tragedy, we decided we needed to do something, anything, however small, to help balance the messages that people are receiving about Muslims and Islam, most of which are just plain false. So it's very important that I start by thanking you all for being here. We can assemble a panel of speakers all we want in an attempt to share the truths about who we are. 
but this would have no impact whatsoever if sincere people like yourselves weren't showing up to hear us. So I am honestly both honored and humbled to be sitting before you today. I'd like to believe that we're all here because we love our community and we love our country and our world. Uh, when we seek to know and understand and respect one another, we are able to elevate ourselves and our respective communities and our beloved country to the highest levels. The title of my talk is How Islam Made Me a Better American. But what does that really mean, to be an American? There are likely many, many definitions for this. However, I am confident that there are a set of ideals with, which resonate with most Americans. Compassion, integrity, mutual respect, kindness, generosity, equality, these are all qualities which I think good human beings, good Americans, strive to embody. And what I'd like to specifically speak today about is a topic that I can address with what I hope is a sincere and passionate heart, and that is the topic of racism. Growing up, I was very close to my paternal grandparents. I would spend summers in North Carolina with them, and since I was an early riser like my grandfather, we would enjoy a daily 7 a.m. breakfast at a restaurant nestled at the bottom of the mountain where he lived. I was proclaimed his favorite granddaughter, partially because I was named after his eldest daughter, Sarah Jo. And Sarah Jo had passed away in a tragic car accident the year before I was born. Apparently I looked like Sarah Jo as well, so his affinity towards me was clear and understandable to all. And in return, of course, I deeply adored him. He was a generous man who showered love and affection on all of us. But there was one thing I remember not knowing how to love about him and that was his deep-seated racism and hatred for people of cover, color. He openly insulted and disrespected black people. He frequently used the N-word. I remember being really uncomfortable with his attitudes and actions towards blacks. So naturally, I exonerated myself from being racist. In hindsight, however, I realized that the post-civil rights era in the South was still rife with unspoken racism. Though there were African Americans in town and in school, we had very little to do with one another. I didn't have any black friends. I didn't live near black people. I didn't sit near them in class or at lunch. Basically, there was minimal to no interaction between them and us. Separate but equal may have been banished by law, but it was alive and well in everyday actions, even in mine. In my mind, however, I was as American as apple pie, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed blue high school cheerleader my European ancestors landed on American shores in the early days of settlement. My mother is part Native American. I lived in southern suburbia and was the daughter of a self-made businessman, attending some of the best public schools in the area, along with church on Sundays. I had my mind set squarely on attending a service academy after graduation. Who could possibly be more American than me? In 1996, I had completed a couple of years at the U.S. Naval Academy before deciding military life was not for me. I transferred to the University of Maryland and got my degree in civil engineering, married my husband Mike, and had our first son, Ben. <laughs> Mike was still in the Navy and stationed in Japan. I stayed in the States to finish my degree, and it was at this time that I was introduced to Islam. Since my talk is not about my conversion story, I won't go into much detail about how I chose to enter this religion, but I do want to share with you how being Muslim completely altered my understanding of race. Before I do that, however, I think this would be an appropriate time to share a few of the Islamic teachings regarding race, which came to us via sayings from our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or via verses taken from our holy book, the Quran, which we believe to be the direct word of God. As I share these with you, please keep in mind the opening line of the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, the document that formed the foundation of our nation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Well, in Islam, we are taught that righteousness is the only quality that makes someone virtuous in the sight of God, not race, or skin color, or lineage, or country. In his last final public sermon to the Muslims over 1,400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad very clearly addressed this topic of racism when he said, O oh people, your Lord is one, and your father Adam is one. There is no favoritism of an Arab over a foreigner, nor a foreigner over an Arab, neither red.
red skin over black skin or black skin over red skin, except through righteousness. We were also taught by the Prophet Muhammad that God created Adam from handfuls of clay and dirt, which had been collected from the different areas of the earth. So just as the dirt of the earth is different colors, we have black soil, white sands, and red clay, the children of Adam come in different colors as well. Finally, the Prophet Muhammad taught us, there is no good in red skin or black skin, but that our value lies only in our righteousness and in our closeness to God. So these are just some of the teachings of Islam that slowly began to permeate my life and to help me develop a deeper understanding of the problems with racism. However, there was one crucial time in my life that these teachings really took hold of me and taught me the true essence of what it meant to be an American. My father, at the age of 50, was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor and given two months to live. I wanted to take my young son, Ben, back home with me to South Carolina so that I could take care of my father in his final days. He readily agreed to have me come, but firmly warned me against trying to convert him to my new religion. I had just become Muslim only three months prior. I assured him I would do no such thing, and I headed to South Carolina. Interestingly enough, in a very short period of time, after quietly observing me and my worship and noting my newfound mindfulness that I brought to my day-to-day -day life, my father began questioning me about my faith. Facing death, he was forced to think about his own mortality, so he started seeking answers to the questions of what might be coming after death and what had been the real purpose of his life. I tried to answer his questions to the best of my ability, but my own limited knowledge of my new religion could not satiate his deep curiosity. He peppered me with questions, and I literally ran out of answers. In desperation to provide him with what he was looking for, I searched for a local Muslim community where I might be able to take him so that he could speak to someone, anyone who could give him the answers that I could not provide. I searched in the phone book, I asked around, Nothing. I could find no Muslims anywhere close to us. I was desperate. For days and nights, I prayed to God. And though I didn't know everything about Islam, I did understand that one of the tenets of the religion is that one condition of prayer is that you have to recognize and submit to the knowledge that only God has the power to answer your prayer. And answer it, he did. One morning, my father stumbled across an ad in the local paper announcing the grand opening of an Islamic center in the next town. He eagerly showed it to me, and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was truly a miracle. God had sent us some Muslims. That very next day, we drove to Rockville, South Carolina to meet these Muslims in the hopes that they could help my father settle the affairs of his soul. To my surprise, and honestly, to my disappointment, we saw that the entire group was comprised of African not one other white person was in the room. My heart sank, certain that this was a mistake. Deep down, I knew there was no way my father could be guided to a new belief system through a group of African Americans. It just wasn't possible. He had been conditioned all his life to spurn them. But another fact we are taught in Islam, God is greater. What you often hear as Allahu Akbar, God is greater than all the limitations we place upon ourselves and the limitations that we place upon others. When my father emerged from the center, he was a man deeply moved by all those whom he had met. He was a man who received answers to the questions that had remained answered for, unanswered for so long. And he was now a man of the Muslim faith. God is truly greater than anything we can imagine. Through the words and actions and sincerity of those whom he had been groomed to hate, he had found acceptance, love, and a faith that he would embrace and practice as a means of drawing closer to his creator until his death almost one year later. May God have mercy on him. This is something Muslims say about those who have passed, similar to when people say, God rest his soul, or may he rest in peace. The black Muslim community in South Carolina took very good care of my dad and me. They would invite us into their homes every Friday after congregational prayers. My father would be with the men and I would hang out with all of the women and children. The men became an unwavering web of support for my father, teaching him, guiding him, and helping him come to terms with his impending death. While I was com comforted and thrilled by the peace that my father had found, this 
was actually a momentous turning point for me as well. For the first time in my life, I had black friends. They were more than friends to me, however. They were my sisters. We would pray together, sing together, eat together, and laugh together. It was a beautiful and memorable time in my life. It was a Friday in February, nearly one year after my dad's conversion to Islam, when he returned to his Lord. At the time of his passing, my two-year-old son Ben, an African-American brother named Abdullah, and I were all sitting at his bedside. By the way, Muslim women often refer to Muslim men as brothers, and Muslim uh, men will refer to Muslim women as sisters out of, a, out of respect. Anyway, this brother had come to visit my father so that he could read from the Holy Quran in his presence. Muslims believe that the recitation of the Quranic words in Arabic brings solace to the heart, and the specific reading of the chapter called Yasin helped ease the soul's passing from this world to the next. It was through the lips of this black man that these verses aided my father's soul. It was the brothers from this community who came to pick up his body. It was they who washed his head and limbs, who perfumed him, who shrouded him, and who prepared him for his burial. They arranged for the funeral, they transported his coffin to the cemetery, lowered his body into the ground, and then prayed over him in accordance with the Islamic rituals of burial. <clears throat> there were rows and rows of black men praying for my father's soul. If only my grandfather had been there to witness that tremendous and powerfully ironic scene. So that was the starting point from which all my unrealized racism began to melt away. It was at this point that I became truly Muslim and truly American. I understood unequivocally the power of humanity without preconceived notions or discriminatory underpinnings. And upon moving to California, I have continued to be blessed with the most amazing friends and community members from all backgrounds, races, and religions. And it is on the premise of mutual respect for all of God's creation that I have found a true kinship with all races and people. I have been taught that to treat everyone with dignity and respect is actually an act of worship. Because of our faith, my life and my husband's life and my children's lives have been elevated. And I hope and pray that we will always be positive contributors to the greater society in which we live. I can surely say with immense humility and gratitude that I am a better human being and a better American for it. It is my sincerest wish that my children, along with all of our children, will lead future generations of Americans based on the premise of God's command to get to know one another in peace and respect and to create a life that uplifts all that is good and suppresses all that is evil. Thank you for taking the time to get to know us and for honoring me by listening to my story. I sincerely pray that this afternoon is just the beginning of a wonderful new friendship. God willing. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. I can, I can hear that story time and time again. It's like I heard it the first time. <laughs> so before we take a, a few minute break and we go into our Q&A session, again, I invite everyone to use the note cards, write any questions you have, and uh, we'll reconvene in just a few minutes. Uh, I just want to share one kind of parable that one of our teachers shared with us. He says, Islam is like, is like water and it flows over various bedrocks, and it reflects the bedrock over which it flows. So when Islam goes to China, it has a Chinese flavor of Islam, but the water is still the same water. It goes to India, it looks a little Indian. It goes to Malaysia, it looks a little Malaysian. And when it comes to America, it looks a little American. Again, the water is the same, Islam is the same, but it looks like it has an American flavor. And I share that in light of the story and in light of why we're here today, to show that we don't have to choose, am I going to be Muslim or am I going to be American? You can be both and you can be both beautifully. And that's our goal and that's why we're here today. So please, everyone take a stretch. We'll reconvene in just about four, four or five minutes or so and we'll collect your cards, prepare for the questions and we'll conclude today at 3 p.m. All right, we're gonna jump right into it. So I'm gonna pass the mic first. Who's gonna begin, uh, Dr. Assad or Hina? Sir, here we go. Mm -hmm.
a small group, but we're curious. <laughs> yeah. So I think what we'll do, uh, is anybody ready to start? Otherwise, I'll jump into a couple. Yeah. I'm going to apologize ahead of time. This is going to be like speed answers, like speed mm -hmm. dating kind of a thing, <laughs> right? Um, because there's, there's about, I'm, I, about 20 questions, and we've got less than 20 minutes, I believe. Um, some of them will probably require longer answers. So I'll start off with, man, why am I starting with this one? OK, so <laughs> the sixth point. This, this one has, has a lot of great questions. The sixth point under faith was about divine control of destiny. How does this impact the question of human free will versus predestination? Brilliant question, whoever wrote this. Uh, it's like a PhD thesis to answer. But I will answer as best I can in a, in a brief format. Um, and if it requires more conversation, um, hopefully we can do that later. Uh, it is, on one level, uh, it's simply stated, Muslims believe in both human free will um, and they do believe in predestination simultaneously. Um, and that seems to be an apparent paradox on one level. So I'm going to sort of delve into that a, a bit deeper. Uh, on one level, taken to its full explanation, it is something deemed to be a mystery. So Muslims will, they do have rational explanations, but there is a point in which the human mind cannot reconcile the two, and they will say that that is the ceiling of, 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 uh, of the human intellect. But one scholar uses this metaphor to explain it, and I, I think it's very helpful. Uh, he talks about uh, a chessboard. Everybody here know how to play chess, familiar with chess, at least hopefully on some level. Uh, a chessboard comes with predetermined rules, right? Um, and none of us can alter the rules of how the horse moves, how the bishop moves, what a castle is, right, etc. But within that, we all have our free will of every move that we play. Um, but depending on how our opponent plays and the circumstances of where our pieces are, you know, I can't be 6'6". Six, six. I've tried, right? I've wanted to many times, especially on a basketball court, like, right? Uh, I cannot change that. That is part of my, uh, that is part of the predestination uh, of which my life engages with, but my, my free will is limited and it works within the parameters of what's be, been predestined. So like the chess player still can make a certain number of moves. I mean, if he's cornered, he's almost in a checkmate, he might only have one or two moves. That doesn't remove his free will to have to work within the rules of, of the predestination. Uh, having said that, this is a very deep philosophical argument. Muslims are definitely not deterministic, um, and they do affirm human free will. Morality is all hinged upon free will uh, in any tradition, I would say, but definitely in the Muslim scholastic tradition. Uh, free will is essential, and that is, uh, in fact, what humans have over all other creation is um, uh, reason and free will. That's what, that, that's what makes us what we are. Uh, the, the rational animal, as, as it would be called by, by the philosophers. Um, and I'm gonna, hopefully this one is a quick one, and then are you guys ready to jump in here soon? Save me. Uh, can you review, discuss the comment about true asceticism? Uh, I, I wasn't clear about the world being in the hand versus in the heart. Um, when something is in your hand, it's something that you use. It's an object um, in which it is outside of you, um, and you know its purpose is to serve another end. When something is in your heart, right, you've become worldly, and you're a person of possessions. There's that nice kind of bumper sticker sounding phrase where we are meant to uh, use, th use things and love people, but instead we use people and we love things, right? It's something along those lines that we should never love possessions in the world and the nice house and the reputation and the car. Um, that the, that the, those things are acceptable in life, but they're means to an end. And if you are a horrible person who is very happy that you have a certain kind of lifestyle or house, then, then, then you become worldly. Um, particularly if your attachment to material possessions um, is what pushes you to start to um, maybe compromise your ethical practices or, you know, Wall Street, anyone, right? Something like that. So, um, so that's because it's in the heart. Now you have greed and you have worldliness. And on a spiritual level, you are not looking to the afterlife. You're not, as Jesus said, you're not using this world as a bridge. You're making this your home instead of the bridge, right? So you're not looking to the, to, 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 to the life to come. Um, that is sort of my, my, my brief answer. I'll turn it over. I had a Muslim teacher once tell us that having the world in your hand and not in your heart also means that if tomorrow God takes away what's in your hands, that it shouldn't change your heart with God. You should still have a good opinion of God. Okay, so I have a question here. Do Muslims believe in demons and the equivalent of Satan? 
Yes, there are three creations of God that we believe in. Um, we got there's human beings who are made of clay, and um, all the different elements and minerals that are in the earth are also in our bodies as well. Then there's angels, which we believe are made of light, and then there are jinn, which are made of fire, and human beings and jinn have the ability to choose between right and wrong, and they will be held accountable on the day of judgment. Angels cannot disobey God. They can only uh, fulfill his commandments. And um, in the Christian, yeah. they don't have free will. Yeah. And so on the, in the Christian tradition, I think the Jewish tradition as well, uh, it's believed that um, Satan, Lucifer, was a fallen angel. Muslims don't believe that, Muslim, because Muslims don't believe that angels have free will. And we believe that Satan, who is named Iblis in our tradition, that he was actually the most learned of all the jinn. He was created from fire. And God gave the commandment after he created Adam to have everyone bow down in front of Adam out of respect. And Iblis actually rebelled. And he said that I was created from fire, he's created from Play. I'm basically I'm better than him. It was the first sin was actually arrogance, and it was a form of racism. He thought he was better than somebody else because of the way he had been created, and he refused to bow down to Adam. And so God expelled him until the end of time, and um, Iblis asked to be given till the end of time to basically test human beings to see whether we obey God or whether we are you know uh, are going to give in to what he encourages us to do. So we believe in jinn created from fire, we believe in angels created from light, and human beings created from clay. So that answers. Okay, I have a few questions. Yeah. Um, here. The first is, uh, why is it the most difficult job to be a Muslim wife? And I think that that was a joke. Um, because, <laughs> because oh. and then his husband is sitting in the audience, so that was um, just a joke. A jab. <laughs> um, another you're, question. Your mic, your mic's wife. I am Mike's wife, and it's not hard to be his wife. Wow. I, it's probably hard to be my. That's the other way around. Um, I think Muslims better sometimes than Christ. So this question says, if I were to become a Muslim, would I be converting, even if I'm not part of any religion at this time? Uh, I think the word converting is just a term. Uh, you could say you entered into Islam, you converted if you went from one thing to another. Some people say you reverted. If, if Islam is like a, a just a natural state of submission to God, the way that Asad explained it, then the idea would be that anyone who's born is already in that state. And so when you come to Islam, you are reverting back to the original state. So there's different ways of looking at it. it the term isn't really that important. Um, and the second question is why are the prayer times specific? Can I pray whenever it works with my schedule? Um, there may be a scholarly answer to this. I just wanted to share my experience. Which when, I, when I was considering becoming Muslim, um, I was very busy. I, actually, I've been busy my entire life. That's just how I am. But, um, I was very busy, and I was doing many things, and I was like, how am I possibly going to fit in the prayer? Like, this is just a whole other thing that I have to add in. I actually talked to a friend of mine and added up the minutes in the day that it would take for me to do the five prayers, and it was, I think it ended up being like about 20 minutes, and I was like, okay, I can give 20 minutes to this. <laughs> and that's how I approached it, which now is like ridiculous, but... Um, <laughs> Um, so it is, you know, it is something that you put in your life, but, uh, you know, the more you, the longer you experience it, the more you realize what the gift of the prayer is, and it's a time when you kind of retreat from the, the, the world that we live in and just give a minute to God, and it's very recentering, um, and it's, it's really a, a blessing, honestly. Um, and another thing I've noticed with some of the things about Islam, like the prayers, which the times do change throughout the year, um, based on the length of the day. You know, the, the early morning prayer can sometimes be as early as like 4 a.m. Uh, in some countries, even earlier than that, 3 a.m. Um, and it can go as late as 7 a.m. So, and then in terms of Ramadan, the month of fasting, it moves throughout the year. So 
in summer, you'll, you'll have these long days of fasting and these short nights, and in the wintertime, you'll have these short days of fasting and these long nights for worship. And so it's one thing I've reflected on, because I've often I've thought to myself, it'd be so convenient if it was just always the same. You'd get into a rhythm and a routine and kind of like, you know, just you'd have, you could count on what you're doing, you know what you're doing, but there's such a wisdom in the fact that it's not like that, because you're always on your toes. It's always fresh. You're just having to think about it and kind of plan for it and, 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 and put your life around it rather than fitting it into everything else that feels important. So um, once again, I, that's not a scholarly answer to the question, but um, it's, it's just my experience. Um, the last question I have is, in Christianity, there is a concept that all humans sin and need forgiveness. When this was widely accepted 500 years ago, it propelled the proliferation of democracy, which said kings, popes, prophets were outside of the realm of sinlessness, and that a balance of power was necessary. Is Islam aligned with this too? Um, absolutely. We are all human beings. We are all subject to sin. We are all uh, worthy of forgiveness. Um, no one has a different status um, in the eyes of God. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. No, this is not a theory. Not she's saying there's no original sin, we're not born in a state of sin, we don't believe that. But we do believe that all human beings have the capacity to sin, to sin and to be forgiven by God. So it's not prophets. You mentioned prophets. So. Yeah, outside the prophets. Oh, yes. Okay. yes. Prophets outside of the prophets are sinners. Yeah, prophets are sinners. We do believe that. Nobody has any questions. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions is, could you talk about the degrees of adherence to Islam? For example, I work with many Muslim women who do not wear the hijab. How are they viewed? It's not our job, or any Muslim's job, or to be viewing anyone else as uh, higher or lower than anyone in the religion. We're supposed to be concerned with ourselves, and the general understanding is that we're hard on ourselves and easy on everybody else. There's many different parts of being a Muslim, many different rules to follow, and everybody has their own um, understanding based on how they were raised, what they were taught, how much they've studied. I didn't always wear the hijab. I decided to start studying my religion, and as I began understanding it and believing in its tenets more and more, I decided to take on the hijab at the age of 28. And uh, my mother had decided to take on the hijab uh, like a year before I did, and you know she was much older than I was. So, um, yeah, it's really, as far as viewing one another, one where Muslims, just like any other religion, you've got the whole spectrum of how much people adhere to the rules and principles. All right, so we only have about a few minutes left. Uh, two questions. Can you explain the no shoes? So uh, Muslims, when we pray, you may have seen that we pray uh, what includes standing, bowing and prostrating, so we put our face on the ground. So a uh, part of it is uh, cleanliness. It's just cleanliness because of how we pray. Sometimes we sit on the ground in our gatherings and our study circles as well. Uh, but also everything that a Muslim does physically, we believe also has a metaphysical reality. So, you know, we wash before prayer, but we believe that water is, is reflects light, the light of God, and so you're cleaning your heart instead. So removing our shoes has that metaphysical element as well, and that it's a humbleness to God, preparing yourselves for prayer, preparing your heart, and so it's both, the, physical, the outward and the inward reality. As we're composed of a body, but our essence is our soul. So every act we do may touch upon our body, but it may touch upon our soul as well. The other question is, what does Islam say about poverty? So, uh, it, poverty is not something shameful. It's not something wrong. Uh, you can have a very honorable poor person and a dishonorable rich person. Uh, we know that in al ghina ghina nafs, richness is the richness of the soul, and that contentment is a treasure that never ends. So, uh, poverty is is not blameworthy. It's not blameworthy, and richness, having richness through wealth is not necessarily praiseworthy. It's using what you have, and giving one dollar in charity can be better than giving $100,000 in charity. If that one dollar is given from a heart and it 
in a manner, in a way that's humble and loving and caring, without arrogance or pride and with sincerity, and if that 100,000 was given with arrogance and pride and showing off and boasting. So uh, poverty, we also believe in the afterlife, that one who has more wealth will be judged longer, possibly. And so poor people will likely enter heaven before rich people, right? Depending on the judgment. So there, there, are, there are statements about that. Uh, I hope that helps answer those questions, and I'll pass it on. Okay, one of the questions is, as a woman who has fought for equality against misogyny and patriarchy, help me understand and not to fear women's roles in Islam. And then it says, thank you. So I, I have to be honest, I'm a little confused by the question because um, I'm not sure what the women's roles in Islam are that feels there's patriarchy or misogyny against it. I mean, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like the principal of this homeschooling co-op that we run. And um, Muslim women have been heads of state, Muslim women have been CEOs of companies. So I'm not sure exactly what the question is. Maybe there's a feeling that because um, Muslims recognize that there is a difference in the genders, that that um, somehow means that they're unequal. That That's not the case, um, because Muslim women maybe cover different parts of their bodies as compared to Muslim men. Um, doesn't mean that there's something more shameful about women or that men are more liberated. It's um, Basically, what I look at for any religion is do men and women have equal access to God? And do they have an equal chance of earning his divine pleasure? And for me, in the religion of Islam, that's absolutely the case. There's no man that I would say is just better than me simply by virtue of being a man. And um, yeah, so I, I would need a little bit more. Um, if the questioner has interest, I would recommend um, reading about the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, specifically, uh, there's books about the women around him, and it's really enlightening to find the people that he were his companions at that time. And there was such a spectrum of the women in his life. I um, mean, there were women who were, you know, in the economics, who were um, fighting in battle. Uh, there were women who were just staying home. It was it was literally everything. So that was his world, and that was what he deemed to be um, okay, and what he supported. And he was supportive of all different personalities of women and all different uh, roles of women. So that shows you what really what Islam uh, teaches uh, about roles of women. Unfortunately, you do see things that are cultural. So there might be a. a Confusion between culture and religion. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, the outward ceremony that we observe in different cultures and countries may be exotic, maybe we interpret it in a certain way within the lens of our own life experience. But when you go back to the root reason why they do what they do, it'll resonate with us by and large. Somebody already mentioned the idea of women in Saudi Arabia not being able to drive. But if you stop and ask the question, well, why did they have that? We, we may surprise ourselves that, that the, the reason why they have their role comes from a good place. The outward application or the ceremony of it may be exotic and odd to us. So I think it's important to, to realize that distinction. Uh, and I found that to be the case in my travels around the world where you know that's the spice of life. People do things differently and celebrate things differently, do things differently. The laws and customs and traditions are, are, are very different. But the fundamental reason why they do what they do, it resonates with the heart. It's the same thing, same reason why we do what we do here. Okay. I'm going to try, uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to try to do in 60 seconds here uh, another very tough couple theologians here in the audience today. Uh, what is a Muslim response to why people suffer? So this is uh, what in, 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 uh, the, philosoph the philosophical tradition is called theodicy. Um, Muslims uh, have written quite a lot about this. Um, and it, it, it would be a different um, answer than I think you would probably get from a, a Christian theologian. Um, Muslims would contend, oh, this is really hard to do in a short amount of time. 
Muslims would contend that the very nature of the world is meant to be an admixture of light and dark, ease and difficulty, good and, and bad. Um, and uh, the purpose of that is it is meant to be a moral testing ground, that we were created as moral beings with free will, and the only way in which we can exercise our moral agency is to um, experience, confront, and engage um, morally challenging situations and scenarios. Um, and uh, within that complexity, um, once you multiply that by you know six billion people sort of all at the same time, you will have a world of um, senseless suffering, of difficulty, of starvation, of poverty. Um, you will have uh, all, all types of things. And these are all ways in which we are morally challenged um, as Muslims. We believe that God created each of us um, to be um, the, a, a vicegerent, sort of a fancy word that I don't think you use except outside of the setting, as, as an ambassador of God on earth. And the question becomes, what are we doing about it? So the hurricanes hit and people are flooding in Puerto Rico. And I mean, where, aren't, where haven't they yet, right? Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy. So the question becomes not, oh, why is the hurricane hitting? Like, well, if there is God, why did he allow this hurricane? The question becomes, this is now a situation that brings about moral challenges and responsibilities upon us. So the question is, do we look up from our steak dinners and say, wow, what a tragedy, and then go back to like, can you pass me the A1 steak sauce? And we continue with our own enjoyment um, while our fellow man, woman, child is, is suffering. So that's, that, that's what it is. But this is uh, a, a, a finite amount of time, um, and it's an arena with a particular purpose. Um, and beyond that is, uh, is God's eternal justice and his wisdom and his mercy. Um, and all of it will make sense and everybody will be compensated. There are people here who are victim of horrible abuses. I don't want to even get into it. We all know the stuff that exists in the world, the human trafficking, you know, the child labor, all of these things, um, and they will have their justice on the day of judgment even if human beings fail to, 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 to attain it for them here. Um, but there would be no test, there would be no moral test for us um, if there weren't uh, the, uh, the result of free will, which is evil and suffering and difficulty and pain, um, etc. So uh, it's, it is uh, an essential component in order for us to exercise our free will, um, and I hope that answers it. If not, I apologize. And my last one, um, how do you define righteousness? How does it apply to moral people who are non-Muslim? Um, so can, so what about moral people who are non-Muslim? Uh, this is, so there are sort of two different questions here. One is, um, there's the theological question of who is quote unquote saved. Um, and what Muslims believe is if somebody knowingly rejects God's message, right? So somebody, um, let's make this extremely simple, right? Um, Pharaoh and Moses. So Pharaoh says, you're a liar, you're not speaking on behalf of God. He rejects Moses' message, he's held accountable as a rejecter of truth, okay? That's black and white, as clear as can be. You're not gonna get a better uh, truth giver than Moses, and you're not gonna get a clearer rejecter of that truth than Pharaoh. Can we agree on, hopefully, on some level there? Um, for everyone else, it gets a little more gray. And what we, what we, can't, we can't say anything about individuals, but what we can say is God holds us accountable for our conscious rejection of truth. Now sometimes we don't get truth, we get something else, we get distorted versions of the truth. We get truth mixed with a little bit of falsehood, we get truth mixed with horrible images on TV. Um, and so how, what our moral accountability is in terms of a theological question of how are they held accountable by God, our answer is that's for God to, 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 to judge. Uh, now somebody can still live a moral life, somebody can still be a person of God, um, in, in their own ways here. Um, and this is proven in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He allowed Christians to pray in the mosque. He would engage with the Jewish tribes. Uh, he, he validated other people's ways of growing closer to God, and in fact called them to the highest callings of their own religious traditions. Um, and so he saw that in them, that they, they could be righteous through their own traditions. Uh, but again, it's, there's like the theological question of who's saved and what are we held accountable for in the afterlife. Um, as one of my teachers always says, theologians 
write things in books, but they're, you know, uh, uh, another one of my teachers says, theology is the quest for the least silly definition of God. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the day, God judges and our human minds try to make sense of it all on some level, but all bets are off when, when, it's, when it's his dominion and, and, and we're on that day. So, I'm done. So we said we're going to honor your time, and we said we're going to honor your questions, and we're going to do both. May I have the unanswered questions, please? So it's, uh, it's just about 3 o'clock, and we have a few unanswered questions. And we do want to honor these questions uh, by not ignoring them. And so uh, I have them here, and uh, I'm not leaving afterwards. Uh, come see me. Uh, I'd be happy to chat, or you can, uh, you, can, you can have my phone number, my email, or contact us via the, the, uh, the website or Facebook, and we will set a time up to answer these questions. Because again, I said the onus is on you to ask the questions, and then we will answer them, and we want to honor that, and we want to be truth, because we want to have a meaningful engagement. So I have these unanswered questions, please come and see me. Today, by the way, in this day in history, was the day that Moses was saved from Pharaoh, <laughs> according to the Muslim tradition. Yeah, <laughs> so he just mentioned it, uh, reminded me. In this day in history, uh, was the day that uh, the Prophet Muhammad traveled, peace be upon him, to, uh, to, to another city, Medina, emigrated. And, and he found some of the Jewish uh, tribes fasting. He said, why are you fasting? And they said, because this was the day that Moses was saved from Pharaoh. And so borrowing from that tradition, uh, Muslims also, he said, we also uh, will fast on this day and the day before or after as well. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a beautiful day to be, to be here together for the Abrahamic faiths and for, for the American people be here today. It was a beautiful moment. So we're going to, I'm just going to conclude with a uh, uh, simple recitation of the first chapter of the Quran called the opening uh, in Arabic. Uh, and it's a prayer. Feel free to participate as you deem comfortable. And a prayer thereafter. <laughs>
We turn to you in everything as we are weak and you are strong and we are poor and you are the provider and we are far and you are close. When we are heedless and forget you, you are still with us. We ask you, our beloved Lord and our provider and our master and our owner, to help us submit to you and surrender to you in a beautiful manner. We ask you to call us to you with gentleness and not with difficulty. We ask you to call us to you with gentleness and not with calamities or tests. And we ask you to help those oppressed throughout the world, whatever their calamity is, of fear, or hunger, or thirst, or coldness, or, or distance. And we ask you to give us wisdom and to grant us wisdom as you are the all-wise and the all-knowing. And we ask you to bless those who have attended today, who have reached out and have come today and honored us today. And we ask you to bless those who have prepared and worked and organized for today as you are the true and the best provider. And we ask you to gather us all in your heaven as no one can do that except you. And that is easy for you. And that is easy for you. And that is easy for you. And we turn to you in the beginning and in the middle and in the end and in every moment. Please accept that from us, our beloved Master and our God. And send your peace and blessings upon all the messengers and prophets of whom you sent to us and all of the righteous who follow them. Amen. Amen. Alhamdulillah.